We're now going to find out how the power of archaeology can change lives. This is really at the heart of everything that Archaeology Scotland does. And it's the ethos of archaeology and should, that should benefit the society and be inclusive and available to all. So we're going to hear from two members of the staff from Archaeology Scotland who do amazing work. Uh, Jane Miller, who is, they're both over here and coming shortly. Jane's our learning officer. <coughs> and Phil, who is project manager of the Adopt a Monument and many other things. Phil, I say, is project manager of the team for the archaeological projects undertaken by Archaeology Scotland and has been responsible for the development of Adopt a Monument, a scheme that works with local communities and helps to train people to care and conserve local heritage. He also continues to play his part in development of it in several European countries now. So it's slowly extending and people are beginning to see the benefits that this can do working with local communities. I'm going to ask, is it Phil or Jane coming up first? Phil, <laughs> both of you are going to come up. Jane is a learning officer who has helped expand the work of Archaeology Scotland, especially in the fields with school children and people with social needs and learning difficulties. And I have to say, we are absolutely thrilled that through Jane's work through the lockdown, they've actually won the engagement and participation category of the British Archaeological Achievement Awards. So it's really a great piece of work. This going through COVID as well, and COVID has not stopped Archaeology Scotland from working. Actually, Archaeology Scotland, Archaeology itself hasn't actually stopped through COVID. So it shows you what you can do, even though we've got this terrible thing going on. Okay, I shall let you first. Thank you very you. much, Mona. Yeah, we're going to do a bit of a double act. And um, I can't see my presenter notes, but it'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> so um, we're just going to chat a wee bit today about, as Moira says, the power of archaeology to change lives. And really, it's a taste of some of the projects that we've developed and run over the past couple of years and many years before that as well. But it doesn't cover all the work we do as an organisation, but they are these projects are the types of work we have been doing recently and across across all departments, really. And it would help if I could change my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah, so as I'm sure all of you know, Archaeology Scotland is an educational charity, and we believe in archaeology's ability to change lives and strengthen communities. And we, our work is really to inspire people to explore, discover, and care for their their local heritage, but also more broadly, Scotland's archaeological heritage. And we're also very proud to be very involved with Scotland's archaeology strategy, which I think one of the other speakers mentioned. And we are the aim lead for aim four of Scotland's archaeology strategy, which is all about encouraging greater engagement. So how can archaeology change lives and strengthen communities? So we're going to chat a little bit, as I say, about some of the projects we've run, and we'll take it in turns to look at a few different things. First of all, uh, I want to think about health and well-being, and how can archaeology play a role in improving people's health and well-being? And as Moira mentioned, during lockdown, I ran a project called Lifelong Learning in Lockdown. And this was a project for people in the Falkirk area who were living with dementia. So it was for those people and their carers, because these vulnerable groups were so used to meeting up in person and supporting each other within, particularly in this case, within dementia cafe groups. They used to get together and it was a great support network for the carers. That obviously disappeared during COVID because they were too vulnerable to, to gather face to face. So Alzheimer's Scotland did a lot of work getting them online and starting up their cafes online, but they really struggled for content. As a lot of you will know, if you've delivered online content, it takes an awful lot of work to produce. So they came to us, they were looking for workshops, online workshops for their participants, for the people living with dementia and their carers. And so they had their online cafe. So they asked me to run some sessions and uh, I ran, I think it was around about 10 online archeology span workshops with their groups. So they all joined via Teams 
uh, and we talked about different archaeological excavations that we had done in their local area. So it was really nice. I could use our archives. I could use some of the objects we have. Um, and we took a slightly different approach. I know a lot of the museums do reminiscence work with people living with dementia, but we took a slightly different approach. We did the, the what's called new learning. So rather than relying on the older people to try and remember things from their past, they're learning together about new things, maybe things they didn't know before. And they're sharing some of their own experiences and knowledge with us as well. So it's as if we're all together learning about new things and sharing experiences rather than putting any pressure on them to think about, oh, do you remember this? Do you remember this? I felt that was quite important to take a different approach when it was online because they didn't have that support directly around them. So, um, so we did this new learning approach, sharing objects via Zoom or Teams and focusing on some of the excavations that we've done, like I said. So we ran the monthly workshops and to make it more engaging, I felt it had to be multi-sensory, but how do you do that online? So the way I approached it was by creating multi-sensory packs that I would post out a week before the online workshop. So all the participants would have their pack. Usually there were four or five little bags in there, all clearly numbered. So it was really simple for them to engage and join in with the activities. Um, and there was the, the packs had something for every sense, basically. So when we were discussing Viking spinning and weaving, I had a spindle whirl to show them on the screen, but they had a little bag of raw sheep's fleece that they could open and sniff which really is, well, it just smells like sheep. So, you know, <laughs> and they also had a bag of um, carded fleece as well that they could tease out and sort of have a go at kind of uh, making their own thread and get the idea of it when I was showing them how the drop spindle work, worked. Um, we always had a modeling activity, which they absolutely loved. So they would have a, a piece of modeling clay each month. Uh, the first activity they did with that worked really well. It was. We had the, the face masks that are on the Stenhouse pottery pots, medieval jugs. Uh, so there's, and there's a lovely little piece that Falkirk Museums did about those, and they all made their own little faces, which is the thing you saw at the, at the start was my little Stenhouse pottery face. So every week we do, every month we do some kind of practical modeling activity. And um, the first bag there, that was, we have a lovely Neolithic uh, polished stone axe head, and it's just the most beautiful object to touch. And if we'd been able to get all those people in a room together, we would have handed that round. But because we couldn't do that, I had to hold it up to the screen. Um, but in their packs, they had little pebbles that I got from the beach, and I polished, well, sanded one side of them so that they could feel the natural stone on one side and then turn it over and feel what the polished stone axe head would feel like on the other side not quite as smooth, but get, getting there. So they could feel that while I was showing them the axe head. So it made it a really multi-sensory experience for them. Um, oh, this is them with their, their Iron Age glass beads made out of modeling clay. Um, but it was just a really, it was a really fun and engaging activity. And we got some brilliant feedback from the staff at Alzheimer's Scotland who facilitated the session, from the participants themselves, and also from their carers. So we had one, one lady whose husband attended the sessions, uh, she was his carer, and she said to me that he usually is quite non-verbal, um, but after the session he said how much he enjoyed it, he talked about it, and he said he was looking forward to the next one. So when we were talking about changing lives, obviously, you know, we can't hugely turn people's lives around. Well, sometimes we maybe can, but you know, sometimes it's just these little changes that really make a difference to somebody's day uh, or somebody's week. And as Moira said, yeah, we were really, really privileged to be joint winners in the engagement and participation um, part of the, the Archaeological Achievement Awards, the CBA's awards. And, but what was, what was actually nicer for me was when after we got the award, we got in touch with Alzheimer's Scotland and we arranged with them to, to meet at the pineapple. Restrictions had lifted a little bit. So we could meet with one of the participants from the online session and one of the members of staff from Alzheimer's Scotland at the Pineapple, which is an amazing site. If, if you haven't been, it's worth going to. Um, so it was absolutely lovely. Met one of the participants face to face and, um, and he came up and spoke to me and told me how much he'd enjoyed it and what it meant to him and how much he looked forward to it, which is really lovely. Some of these projects are quite hard to evaluate, you know, in a, 
uh, in a quantitative way, but the, the feedback we get in Gather is just is so inspiring. So that's one way that we can change lives um, in a little, a little way. And then Phil's going to talk about his stuff. Yeah, so um, I'm going to come back to this. As Maura had already said, the Adopt Monument is about um, local heritage stewardship, community-led stewardship. But actually, over the years, it's become much more about people and people-centric, people-focused. And we've been delivering basically what we were calling engagement projects at the time, but projects that um, provide inclusive engagement with their own people's heritage since about 2009. We've worked with lots of charities like Crisis um, and Bernardo's, et cetera, to develop projects for, for people. And I just, there's some good examples. I'm gonna come back to the detail of DOP later on in the next section, but just here, I just thought it would be very useful to bring up a, a case study right before. So this is a Kilhone jetty. So this jetty is in Kilhone, Nard, Merkin, West Coast, um, up the West Coast. And during lockdown, effectively the, the jetty has been, um, it's been there for, um, 300 years. Um, there's a Neolithic Cairn not too far away. So people have been landing in the bay for quite some time, I suspect. Um, and, the, and it's been eroding for the last 10 years or so. And during lockdown, there's a lot of pressure on people's lives. Um, there's not very much to do in Kilhoen. The pub was shut, the community centre was shut. Um, all those kinds of things um, people might gather at usually. The cafe was shut. Um, and so what they did was they came together to repair the jetty. The thing that was really striking is the way that they were able to pool experiences and skills. So within the community, they had engineers, they had surveyors, they had fundraisers, had caterers, had people who have experience of pouring concrete. Um, and, <laughs> and so that, that's what they did. They just, they came together, worked out a plan for who could do what and how they could take it forward. They raised the money and fortunately we, because of a grant, which I'll come back to later, we were able to part fund this. Chris, you can see them in the, in the yellow jacket there led the project as an experienced engineer and project manager, and they repaired the jetty. But the crucial thing, the really big impactful thing that came out during this lockdown, this was the last January, um, not last year, January 2021, was from developing this relationship on a skills basis, that it became about friendship and about community. And th this group jokingly referred to as the boys from the jetty by one of the ladies involved in the project, but it's much more than that because then they're now a big pool of friends and that includes the women too. It's not, uh, it, so it's a really inspiring for us as we were coming out of lockdown and we were delivering quite small sessions at the time, about three or four participants, whatever the, the rules were allowing and whatever, whatever we were able to achieve safely, that they were able to come together, develop a project that meant more to them, them as people than it did um, from, as from a construction or heritage point of view. And this rolled on into the summer. So by the time we were able to come out here, and this is probably about April or May last year, the, the jetty was being really widely used. As you can see, they installed a time capsule. They've, they've put in places so people can store their canoes and their kayaks. There's, they had more boats land last summer than it had for years, increasing the tourism and the economy, but people were using it. So if you went there in the summer, if you go there this summer, You'll see people swimming off it, fishing off it, landing their boats from the community and from elsewhere. So I just thought that was a quite useful example just to quickly run through there. The sets, another thing we've been doing over the years is Canal College, and this is currently still in, in still running, so it keeps Scotland beautiful, led by our, our colleague Becca Barclay at the moment. But we've been delivering, we've delivered 39, I think it's programs now, with um, young people who are out of education and training. Uh, where we deliver, it's a 14 week course, we deliver three weeks of archaeological work. Um, and it's all about transferable skills, it's all about health and well-being. Um, and they're just brilliant projects. And some of the feedback you get from the young people is amazing. And 70% of the participants are going on to training or employment. Um, and then new audiences. So new audiences is a project led by our colleague Kieran Manship, which is about um, creating archaeological opportunities for marginalized and displaced people. Um, a number of activities have taken place over the last year or so, and we've just lucky enough to have three years of funding from Historic Environment Scotland to take this forward and develop it further. But one of the things we did 
last year was uh, undertake some excavations. We use football as a kind of crossover, um, as a hook, um, as a subject matter. And we excavated the site of the very first, Scot Scotland's first international stadium at Hamden. It was Hamden Bowling Club at the moment. The current ground you might see in Glasgow was the third iteration. This is the first one. Um, and we found bits of the perimeter of the site, et cetera. But what we did is we had volunteers from 11 different countries on site. We had multiple organizations that were, were, in, were multiple partners and organizations was part of the project. And it was, a, we also were, had a really nice outcome in terms of bringing people together from the south side of Glasgow and new, new Scots and new Glaswegians. And again, one of the main things that we learned from the project was about how to be inclusive, what kind of, how to um, work with people and, and some of the things that we needed to cover, such as transport costs for, for the volunteers and the correct style of lunch and being able to involve other charities, other organizations in the south side of Glasgow was amazing. And some of the big impacts on this work were really astonishing for us because obviously we were looking for a football stadium. We were looking to be inclusive and um, gather people together. You can see this photo, everyone's just finished backfilling. That's why some of them are happy and some of them are tired. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's brilliant. And we had so some of the participants have been in hostels and hotels for seven months by this point. Um, and the outcomes, the feedback we've been getting right, was actually an opportunity to meet new people, see a part of the city that have not been before, and to learn and practice their English. And that, that there was just a, you know, I guess we suspected some of those things would, be, would happen. That's what we prepared for. But it's just amazing to hear that firsthand. Um, and as Jane said, I think it's a little moment. This is not, we're not tackling the root cause of um, a lot of these issues, but we were able to generate moments and um, positive experiences. Yeah, if somebody gave us the funding, we could maybe go on to look at the root causes, but that's a bigger project. But yeah, and another thing we are interested in doing is, is looking at the attainment gap and closing the attainment gap, which is a big priority for the Scottish Government. So the attainment gap is the children from poorer backgrounds do less well in school as their peers in affluent areas, and that should not be. So it's about closing the gap in attainment. And again, you know, we have been thinking about what can we do to support this? How can we help? So we developed um, a program called Attainment Through Archaeology. Um, and we deliver these workshops as either one day taster sessions up to 10 week programs. And Attainment Through Archaeology is our skills development employability program. So very hands on practical outdoor workshops with very small groups of participants. So they get a lot of input. Uh, and it's to kind of make up that, try and close that gap by giving these young people a bit more of that sort of specialist input. Um, and we, we target young people, we, well, we work very closely with the schools. So the schools tend to select the young people for us. So they're young people who are struggling to engage in mainstream education. They're the young people that live in areas of multiple deprivation. Um, so the schools tend to select the young people that they think would benefit most. Um, we always link our workshops to the curriculum and, uh, and also to the skills that they're expected to develop within school. So it's an opportunity for them to use previous curriculum based learning that they've done in school and actually use that in a, in a workplace, as, you know, because they're out with us, they're in a real world context and they're using some of the skills and the knowledge that they've gained in school. So it's a bit more meaningful for them. Um, and we, we do feel the feedback we get from the young people is it does seem to build their confidence, partly because they're a bit more relaxed. It's a, it's a better working environment for them. And we're outdoors as well. So it's a, it's a different, different kind of setup. And the transfer, transferable skills that they tend to get out of it are one of the most important things. So all that team working, timekeeping, even critical thinking, planning and evaluating what they're going to do. Um, and I know that they feel like their voices are really heard through these projects, which I think is very important for them. We do this really, it started off really working with older teenagers uh, and it was a bit more about employability. But we did get from primary schools, we, from the teachers there, they said there was also a need at that level too. And at that level, it's more about broadening horizons and raising aspirations. So it's about 
showing those young people in, in different areas that there are, there's so many opportunities out there, you know, you, but you might maybe not heard of them before, but we can introduce you to them. So it's about broadening horizons, really. And then with the older uh, young people, so the secondary school students, it's about skills development. Um, and we've delivered over the past year, we've delivered lots and lots of workshops. I think it's 70 we're up to now in the last year, 70 workshops and over 370 individuals who've engaged. Some of those individuals will just have come along for a day, but some of those individuals will have done 10 workshops with us. So that's quite a high level of engagement. We are quite a small team really, so it is, <laughs> it's exhausting, but uh, no, it is good. And uh, we also have our Heritage Hero Awards, which means they actually get something for the, for the work they put into a project that is recognized and they, they are all sort of eligible for a Heritage Hero Award, which is our wider achievement award for history, heritage and archeology span projects. And a lot of the schools use this now, I think for up to just over 15,000 Heritage Hero Awards have been issued across Scotland since, uh, since it started in 2016. So it's, it's going from strength to strength. So we're, we're showing these young people that we value the work that they do and we're giving them a certificate to see that. Oh. <laughs> Hurry up, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so we thought there's, there's also community capacity building, and for lots of you already know uh, about Adopt a Monument, it's been running for 30 years, we've done 115 projects, um, we've worked from Shetland to the borders and Dumfries Galloway, um, there are gaps, um, Bruce well knows, in Aberdeenshire and some other places, um, we deliver conservation field work and training and advice and stuff, but one, and Carn Glass, um, it's a great example of how this all comes together in terms of conservation of the site, interpretation, and, and brilliant support from Alison, our very own Alison Sheridan, um, here on this project. Um, but what this kind of leads to, and that creates a small kind of these small hubs, I suppose, and brings different sectors of society together, bits of community together, and creates opportunities for tourism and visitors. But we've basically been coming towards this on a, a kind of grander scale over in Arden America with our Real World West project which is funded by um, the EIDF, Nature Scott and Historic Environment Scotland. And, the, and this basically this project is designed with the local heritage group, Arden American History and Heritage Association, works, has a lot of heritage outcomes in a very similar way to Adopt a Monument, but it is based upon the community development plan. So in that, there are aspects of isolation, training and skills, opportunities. And so that's what the project was all based upon. Um, and what we've been doing, you've seen the jetty, this is Soldal Bay, Neolithic Cairn, a Viking burial, all sorts of things, um, with the academic partners in this project, uh, was really kind of a catalyst for that. Um, and, it, and that's been taken over into other projects. So as I say, the jetty, the lighthouse, um, several other sites. And this is just a picture of um, Paul in some bracken. Um, <laughs> but again, <laughs> creating opportunities for, um, engagement one minute Moya. honestly uh just really really quickly um so a lot of the work we've done in the past has been very much about working with distinct audience groups um but that doesn't really answer the the issues that lockdown has thrown up which is all about reconnecting and community cohesion so we're starting to work a lot more on intergenerational programs and we were really lucky to work with the Citadel Youth Centre in Leith, who have a fantastic interge intergenerational project called Old School. And they get older, vulnerable members of the community together with young people from the local academy, and they work together. And they work with us on a 10-week project in Leith. The young people learn new skills, or they did a bit of facial reconstruction, but we don't have time to talk about that. Um, they did, you know, graveyard survey, gravestone recording, building recording. This is this is their amazing uh, youth centre, which used to be a train station. Um, they created a little walking route, just a 10 minute walking route with different heritage points along it. Um, and that was, you know, some something for the older people, try and encourage them to get out and, and things to see along the way. Um, and then they were, all, they were all gamers, it was all boys in this group, and they were all gamers, and they just wanted to make computer games. So we managed to persuade them to, to go old school with their games as well. So they created Top Trumps, 
which then linked to the walking trail. So the idea is they do their 10 minute walk, they go back to the Citadel, they have a cup of tea, and the young people and the older members of the community have a game of top trumps together. And, and it's got little, obviously it's got the little chunks of information. And they designed the game, took the photos, did the categories, worked it all out themselves. Uh, and there's now, it's featured in the digital intergenerational practice toolkit that um, Citadel have produced. And it's also in another toolkit as well. So that's kind of our legacy in trying to encourage other people to do similar projects that we kind of model this and get out. And I'm finished, we're finished. And now we're just going to do more intergenerational work. And yes, and join us. We're a membership organization. Please join us and buy things and join us. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, Moira. <laughs>